All right, so I am Robert Sykes, KetoSavage.com, and I'm presenting for KetoCon Online here, and I'm presenting on Escaping the Keto Confusion, Mastering Your Nutrition. So, like I said, I'm a lifetime natural competitive bodybuilder. I've been ketogenic for six years now, and I've been, natural, uh, I've been a natural bodybuilder for about 10, and all of the benefits have come since the ketogenic diet for the most part. I've learned a lot in the time being, and I'm excited to share some of that knowledge with you today. So motivation for this presentation topic in the first place, there's been a lot of confusion in the ketogenic space. Uh, there's been several different speakers that have come since the ketogenic diets gained popularity. And with that, you've had just a lot of varying opinions on what the best protocol is for losing body fat, building muscle, and really optimizing with the diet. And I feel like being a natural bodybuilder, I've been able to kind of hone that process in and presented in the past about different ways of, you know, really dialing in your ketogenic journey, but I really wanted to make this presentation very actionable. I feel like people come to these conferences wanting and searching for actionable steps that they can take home and apply, and I hope you'll get that uh, with this information today. So I'm a practitioner of everything I'm about to present. I've, I've incorporated these practices with my clients. It's worked well for them. It's worked well for myself. I'm actually just now coming out of a competition prep. So I've been able to kind of tweak a few things and learn more from that. And I really want to stress the point that even if you're not a bodybuilder, even if you're just trying to improve your health and live a better, more well-rounded lifestyle, a lot of these principles will be directly applicable to you as well. The beauty of bodybuilding is that I'm able to kind of go to the extreme to see what the different thresholds are on these principles and how they would apply to the normal everyday person. So let's dive in. First off, I want to kind of lay some preliminary groundwork. If you're trying to introduce a change in your composition, whether that is to build muscle or to lose body fat, I want you to be fully versed in uh, the ketogenic diet in the first place and like give, it, give your body some time to adapt. You can't really go into trying to uh, do an aggressive cut or an aggressive building phase if you're not really adapted well in the first place. So before you really try and dive into all the nuances and, and optimize that last 20% of what you can get out of the ketogenic diet, just be healthy in the first place. Get adapted. Give your body the time it takes to, to adapt to the ketogenic diet. That takes time. Being adapted for two weeks isn't near as optimal as being adapted for six months or even two years. So know that going into it. Know that the ketogenic diet can be leveraged to improve your composition and your health. But I highly encourage you to just understand the basics and lay that preliminary groundwork before you go into an aggressive cut or a building phase. So I was trying to think of ways to to lay this out in an easily digestible format. And I feel like seven steps to savagery just kind of rolls off the tongue pretty well. So that's what we're gonna roll with here. Um, first off, establish your baseline. This used to not really be an actual phase or step. I would kind of brush over this. And people would also just, it, it's very important, but people would kind of brush over it as well. If you don't know where you're starting from, you can't possibly really optimize for where you're going. So I want to make this an official phase, an official step in whatever your journey is and give it the time it deserves because this is key. So first off, you need to have a healthy caloric metabolic baseline. Knowing that you, know, you have to have a, a healthy intake of food to begin with is important because if you're starting a compositional change journey and you're, you're consuming far too little or far too much, it's not really going to be optimal for knowing what steps need to be taken to improve your current situation. So giving yourself some time to figure out what your individual baseline is from a metabolic standpoint and from a caloric standpoint is key. So if you're like trying to, to make an adjustment, make a change, if you're going to work with a coach, if you're going to dive in and do this on your own, take a couple of weeks to figure out what your body naturally gravitates to from a hunger standpoint and track that, like know some numbers, know what your average protein intake is, what your average fat intake is, what your average carbohydrate intake is, and be honest with yourself as to what those numbers are coming in at. Knowing what your body fat is is also key. Uh, there's several different ways to, to gauge that. You don't have to have these dialed in so 100% accurate that it's like, you know, set in stone, but have a good general idea of what your current composition is to begin with. Track your weight. A lot of people have, um, you know, varying views on the importance of the bathroom scale, whether or not to track that or not. And my personal take is if you're happy with where you're at, compositionally speaking, then don't stress about it. But if you're wanting to see a change in that, then being honest with yourself, being honest with those numbers and gathering that data is key. You can't really 
know where you're going if you don't know where you're at currently. Uh, get some preliminary blood work done. Go get some labs, test drawn. Just kind of know what your cholesterol is, know what your uh, hormones are. Just kind of have some preliminary groundwork there. Take some measurements. Take some progress pictures. This is also something that gets brushed over. I'm like, it's like pulling teeth trying to get my clients to take pictures and measurements, but it's so incredibly important because there will inevitably be times when you're trying to adapt to a new diet to make some changes. The scale is not really doing what you want it to, and you're not having any outside metrics to measure against. Have some metrics, have some measurements, have some pictures that you can take and reflect back on and compare against. And then also just have some, some, some relevant uh, metrics with regard to strength, like what's a good baseline bench press or push-up count or sit-up count that you can gauge and measure against as you make these changes. Uh, a couple of useful tools that I find beneficial are um, like a good macro tracking app. I personally use My Macros Plus. There's a million of them out there. Heads Up Health has got a great interface for syncing all this data. Um, lab tests, you can do Let's Get Checked, Ulta Lab Test, Direct Labs, there's again a million of those. Um, body fat, DEXA is the gold standard, but having the ability to do something that's cheaper and more convenient is great. Like um, a caliper test, I use a pinch caliper test to get a, a good running baseline on what my body fat is. Bod pod, in body, stuff like that. All right, and you're gonna wanna track all those metrics throughout this process, by the way. You're gonna wanna be able to know and gauge what your body's doing, at least on a bi-weekly basis. If you're getting pictures, measurements, and uh, some of these metrics every two weeks, you'll be able to confidently know what changes are happening. So the whole purpose of step one here, like I said already, is you can't really know where you're going if you don't know where you're at. So be honest with yourself, be honest with your numbers, have a clear view as to what your starting position is, because then we can know what adjustments need to be made. We can know what our starting macros need to be, how aggressive we need to add or decrease those macros, and then go from there. One thing a lot of people make the mistake of is they'll just arbitrarily jump into a certain caloric cut. They'll say, okay, I'm dropping calories by 500, but they don't even know what their baseline is. So they may be dropping much, much more so than necessary, and then they run out of runway, so to speak, because there's no macros left to play with. So have some tangible metrics at the onset. Now, I'm a, I've got this graph here. This is using my numbers. I've grayed out the other phases so we can really kind of focus in on each individual phase as we go. It's kind of hard to see. It's small print here, but I want to talk about what this graph illustrates, and it'll make more sense as we go through these phases. But the top graph there shows my weight, which is the top mark, um, and then we've got my macronutrients, and the carb count is very low, so it's scaled it up higher, so it, it looks like it's going to be closer tracking with the protein and fat, but it's actually based off of a 10-gram increment, so it's actually much lower than it illustrates here. The bottom graph is going to illustrate my caloric intake, my body weight, and my body fat measurements. So keep that in mind as we go through it here. All right, phase two, establishing a protein threshold. One of the big topics of debate right now in the ketogenic space is how many grams of protein should you have? A lot of people are very conservative with that protein intake, and many people are very liberal with that protein intake. The thing is, there's no one-size-fits-all formula for protein. It's going to be dependent on your lean muscle mass, uh, quantity is going to be dependent on what your caloric expenditure is, what your activity levels are, what your age is, what your sex is. There's so many variables at play when it comes to protein. So rather than backing yourself into a corner and sticking to a, a number that a macro calculator spits out at you, let's figure out what your body as an individual responds best to. The best way that I've found to do this is from the numbers that we established in that phase one, figuring out what your current caloric intake is, if that is a healthy intake, then keep those calories the same. No need to change it if it's working well for you and your body's kind of leveled out at that equilibrium point. Let's start out with about an 80% fat ratio. This is the ketogenic diet after all, no sense in not having a high fat diet to start. And then about 0.8 to 1.2 grams of protein per lean pound of mass is also a good place to start. Keep the carbs low, 10 to 15 total grams. That way you're gonna be removing a lot of the noise in the equation. If your carbs are too high, you're going to get some false readings with regard to what your glucose is doing, what your ketones are doing, what your bloat is doing, what your GI tract is doing. So having a low total carb count is going to be key to really optimizing what protein and fat ratio you respond best at. Now, what we're going to do in phase two here is gradually increase that protein. So everybody's going to have a different protein threshold. Everybody's going to thrive at a different protein intake. So treating your body as the individual that it is we can gradually scale that up and see what you respond best to. Eventually, 
you're going to hit what I call a protein threshold. And that's going to look a little bit different for most people. But for me personally, these are signs of an of hitting that protein threshold. You're gonna see some increased blood glucose. Your ketones are gonna typically dip. Um, you're gonna have some GI distress, some bloating. You're not gonna sleep as well. You're gonna have a little bit less energy throughout the day. For me personally, my protein threshold hits when I'm at about 70% of my calories coming from fat or at about a one-to-one -one, uh, protein to fat ratio. If I dip much below that, I start experiencing some of these adverse effects. Uh, the whole point of this is to, like I said, not back yourself into a corner and take any one protein recommendation as you know something set in stone. What your body responds best to is going to change based off of how much lean muscle mass you have, like I said, your age, your sex, all these different variables at play. So giving your body the opportunity to experiment and, and play around with these different protein intakes as you go through a phase like this is going to be key because then you can really get honed in for how you respond best as an individual. Plus, this is going to kind of prime the pump for the later phases of this prep. And protein has a higher thermic effect to food. So if you can kind of benefit from that at the onset and leverage that as we go, it's going to be advantageous. Now, let's spend a little time on this graph here. Phase two, increasing the protein. If you can see that star on the top graph, that's basically where the fat grams and the protein grams intersect. So I started to see an adverse effect once I was about at that one-to-one -one ratio, which for me here was about 200 grams of protein and 200 grams of fat. That top line is my weight, and you can see it's starting to trend down, but it starts to level off a little bit there towards the, the tail end as I'm coming close to that threshold. So tracking these metrics is going to give you some good data points there. All right, step three, we're going to taper all the macronutrients. Now that we've found and established our individual protein threshold, we figure out what ratio we respond best at. We're going to gradually take calories down. Calories do count. Yes, they do. And we're going to gradually drop down protein and fat. Carbs are staying low. That's just how they're going to be there at the whole process here. And what we're doing here is we're applying pressure. Think of your body as, um, think of your body as a, a meter, and we have to apply enough pressure to force that adaptation to happen. If your body is not getting you know, pressured, there's no reason for it to change. If we, if we provide a stimulus, it's going to have to adapt in some form or fashion. In this case, the stimulus is a gradual decreasing of overall calories from both protein and fat, which is going to cause an adaptation. That adaptation is going to take the form of fat loss. Now, by gradually decreasing both protein and fat, we're going to be increasing the dietary fat ratio. Since fat has nine calories per gram and protein has four calories per gram, roughly kind of depends on what type of protein and fat source you're getting those from, but that's generally accepted. Um, we're going to have an increasing fat ratio overall. So we've increased protein going up. We're going to be increasing the fat ratio as we're going down. Both protein and fat are dropping from a gram standpoint. So overall calories are dropping but the ratio is actually in favor of fat as we go farther and farther into phase three. That's going to be good because as that fat ratio increases and calories are dropping, you're going to be in a more anti-catabolic state because you're going to be producing more ketones and ketones are going to be helping helpful to keep that lean muscle tissue that you've built throughout the course of your training. Now this phase is also the longest phase. It's typically the hardest phase the most boring phase like nobody wants to just gradually drop calories but doing so in a gradual manner and not second guessing yourself or seeing everybody else around you eating a bunch of food is going to be key because this is where the discipline really comes into play um, the main point of step three here is to not drop calories so drastically that you 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 take you take away your food your fuel source before it's necessary a lot of people they do a massive caloric drop too soon, and then they run out of runway too soon, and then they inevitably quit their, their diet, and they don't get to where they're wanting to go from a compositional standpoint. So gradually taping the calories from like a 5-gram or 10-gram a week standpoint is key here. Like I said, it's anti-catabolic. It's going to help with the energy because you can be producing more ketones as calories are dropping. Now, here's phase three graphed out. As you can see, my weight has been dropping throughout this whole phase both protein and fat is dropping. And then, like I said, that carb count looks like it peaks over the fat, but it's kind of scaled differently here. The carbs are going to stay low throughout. And then if you look at the second graph down low, you'll see that my body fat percentage, which is that blue line, 
has been gradually dropping this entire time as well, along with calories and weight. Now, step four is gonna be interesting. We're gonna be doing a lot of tweaking to get things dialed in here. As calories drop, your body's metabolism down regulates. This is true no matter what diet you're following, whether it's ketogenic or flexible dieting or if it fits your macros. When you reduce the amount of fuel your body's consuming, your body has a survival mechanism in, mechanism in place and that mechanism is to downregulate metabolism so that you survive. That's totally normal. The best way to mitigate any unnecessary downregulation of the metabolism is to try and trick your body, so to speak, in a way to keep that metabolism ramped up. And the best way to do that is to have strategically placed periodic increases or surpluses in that fuel intake. So a lot of people do this with a carbohydrate refeed or you know, a super high calorie, you know, TKD or CKD approach, I think this is unnecessary. I think you're going to benefit much more from a strict ketogenic perspective and do so with an increase in dietary protein and dietary fat. This seems to work much better. Plus, it's not introducing this unknown variable. If you're ketogenic, your body is running well on proteins and fats anyways, then leveraging that from a refeed standpoint as well is going to be much more optimal. I like to start out with about a 30 or 40% increase in daily calories and then going from there, adjusting up as needed and as you're getting some feedback from your body. So about a 30 or 40% increase in calories from fats and proteins once a week to start, see how your body responds. And then if need be, you can do a two day consecutive refeed. One benefit of the ketogenic diet is that since fats do digest and absorb a little bit more slowly, you can oftentimes benefit from doing a two-day back-to-back refeed more so than you could if you were doing carbohydrates as well. Um, and the main point of this is to help bust through any plateaus. If your body is down-regulating metabolism, which it will be doing as calories drop, sometimes you'll see your weight stall and your performance uh, stalls as well. By providing this stimulus and this bump in calories, you actually see a um, things start to move again. Your, your weight will oftentimes start dropping. Your body fat will start dropping. It can be plateaued for weeks. You can be at a very low caloric intake. You introduce a couple of weeks of these strategically placed refeeds and that will get the scale moving. That'll get the body fat dropping yet again. The main thing is to have a strategy here. You don't want to just have a free for all, you know, overconsumption of calories with no plan or rhyme or reason because you need to have something you can track and then keep honed in and dialed in if need be. So again, phase four is very short in the grand scheme of things, um, which is why it's not, not a whole lot going on in the graph on this one. Uh, phase five is a peak week. So for me, as a competitive bodybuilder, this is the week that I'm prepping for a show. This is when I'm actually doing my show. But this is still applicable even if you're not a bodybuilder. A lot of people will use this during a photo shoot, um, even if you're not trying to look a certain way. Just simply having the knowledge that you're going to gain from this peak week uh, for your own benefit going forward is going to be key. Calories will be at their lowest point. Your refeeds will be dialed in. Uh, this is the prime condition for when you really want to track this data. If you want to take pictures, if you want to do a competition, now is the time to do it. Uh, but even if you're not, like I said, you're going to learn so much about your body during this phase because the information, the feedback you're getting from all these manipulations is so much real. It's like real time data. If you're, if you're, at a lowest body fat, your calories are at the lowest. Every manipulation you make, your body's giving you almost instant feedback as to how it's responding to that. Whether it's good feedback or bad feedback, that's valuable feedback because then you can take it and run with it throughout your life going forward. Uh, main purpose of this is, like I say, give yourself something to peak for um, and just have this information at your fingertips uh, long beyond this cutting process here. Another benefit that people don't realize too is that when you reach this low body fat percentage, your body becomes familiar with it. If you've never reached that low body fat percentage before, it's unknown territory, it's uncharted waters. But if you get down low or if you get down lowest you've been personally, your body now has that in its memory bank and it can kind of return to that point much easier in the future because it's been there before. So a lot of people will get down really lean for a body, like from a bodybuilding standpoint and it's easier to get lean and going forward. Even if you're not a bodybuilder, having the ability to get lean easier and easier each time you cycle through is advantageous. Again, that's a short phase, so there's not much information there on the graph, but you can kind of see how we're increasing calories and coming from those fat and protein sources during the refeeds there. Now, I want to spend a lot of time on reverse dieting here as well, because this is something that is 
very, very applicable, whether you're a bodybuilder or not, just simply, simply, simply wanting to improve your overall health and, and benefit from a met, 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 I can't speak today. A metabolic standpoint is going to be key. A lot of people will be in a chronic deficit, dieting for far too long, have their metabolism downregulated for far too long, and then it's hard to recover from that. Their body stays at a higher body fat percentage because it's convinced that calories are scarce and anything that you do consume, it's going to readily convert to adipose tissue. So having a period of time in which you're consuming maintenance calories or even a surplus intake is going to be good because it's convincing your body to ramp up that metabolism and that food is not scarce and there's no need to store that extra body fat. So we're going to basically leverage the refeeds that we introduced in phase four and five and kind of have an inverse relationship with that going forward. So as you increase your weekly caloric intake, that refeed intake starts to drop down until they more or less meet in the middle. Um, one thing that you're going to want to have going on here for you is that when you do take your calories down very low, it's going to have an impact on your hormones as well. So metabolism is going to take a hit and your hormones are going to take a hit, specifically your leptin and ghrelin hormones. A lot of women lose their cycle during a competition prep, which is not really healthy in the long term either. So being able to reset those hormones at, an, at a healthy uh, equal, uh, equilibrium baseline is going to be key. The only way to do it is to bring food back into the equation. You can't stay at your body's leanest indefinitely, and you can't stay at that low caloric intake indefinitely. So gradually ramping calories back up is going to be key. Um, like I said, basically, this is, this is very important because so many people, I can't stress this enough, so many people, even if they're not a competitive bodybuilder, they're constantly moving from one diet to the next. They're yo-yo dieting. They're going from one crash diet to the next, and they're just chronically in a caloric deficit. When you're in a caloric deficit for long term, you're going to see, I mean, you're literally shaving years off of your life. I get so many inquiries, so many emails, so many calls, so many clients that have dieted for far too long without ever having a period of increasing that caloric intake. That's the best thing that they can do. I see this a lot in females too. So especially females out there, if they've been dieting for far too long, increasing calories and resetting the baseline at a healthy intake is going to be key. And this is what this phase looks like here. So you can kind of see in the graph how the weight is starting to go up a little bit. You're going to have to expect a little bit of weight gain when you do increase calories because, like I said, you can't stay at that low body fat percentage indefinitely. The, the weight's going to go up a little bit. The body fat percentage is going to go up slightly. Proteins, fats, obviously going to go up as well with overall calories. And then with step seven, this is basically what makes this whole process sustainable. So the refeeds get phased out because the weekly calories have returned to a healthy baseline intake. And then you can gradually increase that baseline intake over time as your body responds well to it. Just continue to track your weight, your body fat percentage, your metrics, your measurements, and see kind of what your body's telling you there. If you start to see an unnecessary increase in weight and body fat, then you'll know that there's not really any benefit to continually increasing those, those calories. So continually tracking those metrics and kind of gauging to see what your body responds well to, uh, even from a macronutrient standpoint, like once you've reached that healthy baseline and calories that are good are at a good salt intake to begin with, then you can start playing around with what ratios you perform best at. You know, you're liable to hit a protein threshold on the reverse side of this as well as calories get higher. So figure out if you perform best at a 78% of your calories coming from fat, or maybe you prefer 75%. But playing with these numbers as you reach the healthy intake is going to be key. And again, this is going to improve hormone function, metabolic rates, and it's going to, when you transition into a building phase and you're eating more food overall, it's going to prime the pump and like to build more lean muscle tissue. It's hard to build muscle if you're in a chronic deficit. You need to have a surplus of energy and a surplus of building blocks, amino acids, to increase lean muscle tissue. The more lean muscle tissue you have, the better your metabolic rate is going to be in the first place. So it just kind of all works together in a symbiotic fashion to improve your metabolism and baseline starting point. And then again, this is what that looks like on a graph. These are all based off of my numbers. So my phase seven looks very short because I've just now reached phase seven coming out of my competition prep. But ideally, phase seven is the longest phase. And I've got a graph that kind of illustrates that going forward here. 
Um, I will, I'll go ahead and just show that graph. So here we got phase one through six is what you see in the beginning there with the calories dropping, metabolism dropping, the body fat dropping. And then phase seven and beyond, ideally I recommend about a one to three ratio. So if you're spending a third of your time in a deficit, spending the other two thirds in a surplus or maintenance is gonna be key. For me personally, I'm prepping for a competition for six months. I'll probably spend the next two, two and a half, maybe even three years in a caloric maintenance or surplus to give my body the time it takes to reset that baseline, reset my hormones, have a better, healthier starting position than I was when I began, and to focus on building lean muscle tissue. So many people come to me and they're wanting to have this short-term fix to you know looking good for a wedding or looking great for the beach, looking good in a bikini. And it's just a very short-sighted way of viewing this. And when you look at your health, when you look at your nutrition, when you look at your training, through the lens of a long-term approach, it makes it so much more sustainable. You can get excited about what you're gonna look like and feel like and perform at, you know, when you're in your 80s or 90s instead of what you're looking like and feeling like for the next week. And when you have that long game approach, it's gonna make doing the day-to-day -day steps necessary to make that a, real, a realistic goal much more sustainable. If you go into a competition prep or a, a goal to lose body fat and you view it through the lens of, I can really hone num these numbers in. I can track my body's metrics. I can see how things are responding and chip away at it every single day. It makes six months fly by in no time. And by doing it consistently with a disciplined, concerted effort for those six months, you're going to get so much more of a better return on that investment than if you just jump from one crash site to the next. And then having legitimate building phase where you embrace an additional, you know, couple of percentage points in body fat or a little bit more, you know, skin on you than when you're in a in a deficit but you know in your heart of hearts that you're putting lean muscle tissue on so that the next time you go through a prep or the next time you go through a cutting phase you have a much better starting position off to begin with that's healthier that's more sustainable and then each each year every three years you cycle through this whole process again but each year every three years you get better and better and better it's truly the fountain of youth i mean the ketogenic diet pair with Strategic intermittent fasting is paired with, you know, these these properly placed strategic macro manipulations in the context of resistance training. That is the best thing you can do for your long term health. And if you're doing that consistently year after year after year, you're going to be around for a lot more years. You're going to have much more quality years to spend with your loved ones. You're going to make this whole life that much more worth living. So that's what I would encourage people to do. And that is the end of my presentation. So let me hit the stop.